So we're going to get started. My name is Sibila Martinelli. I would like to welcome you to this webinar, which is mainly targeted to participants and institutions from widening and third countries. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. In this one hour webinar, I will give a short introduction to the Marie Skodowska Curie actions in general, and then put the focus on a currently open call. The Research and Innovation Staff Exchange, or short, RISE. Participation in this webinar will hopefully enable you to identify opportunities and enhance your innovation potential through interdisciplinary and intersectoral research, secondments and training in Europe. Because RISE promotes international and cross-sector collaboration through exchanging research and innovation staff and sharing knowledge and ideas from research to market and vice versa. This webinar is facilitated by eResearch as part of the Net for Mobility Plus project. My name is Sibylla Martinelli and I'm the Swiss national contact point for what is called Marie Skodowska Curie Actions. Over the next hour, you will find out much more about what that's about. I'm sorry, but currently the changing of the slides is not possible. We have to figure out how we can um, improve this. Okay. So Net for Mobility Plus is the worldwide network um, of national contact points for the Marie Skodowska Curie actions. It is a European project which aims to strengthen the network of MSCA NCPs in order to respond to the needs of our clients, to increase visibility of the Marie Skodowska Curie actions NCP support, and also to promote the Marie Skodowska Curie actions. Further information about the project and a lot of other useful information can be found at this link. The presentation will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel. And the PDF version of this presentation will also be published on the Net for Mobility Plus website, so you can access all the links presented. Questions that could not be answered during the webinar can be addressed to the NCP in your country. Their contact data can be found on the funding and tenders portal of the European Commission. Now let me give you an overview of today's webinar on the Research and Innovation Staff Exchange of the Marie Skodowska Curie Actions, which is in fact an, an excellent mobility opportunity for academic as well as non-academic partners. First, I will give you a short introduction to the Marie Skodowska Curie Actions in Horizon 2020, provide you with some background information and briefly introduce the actions. We will then focus our attention on the Research and Innovation Staff Exchange, the RISE scheme. We will have a look at the different eligibility conditions you need to consider. I will also share some statistics, talk about the moments for you to consider about how you can look for partners and how the submission of projects work. Then I will have a closer look at the different parts of the proposal. And last but not least, you will get some information on what kind of support you can get and where. So before we dive into the details of the RISE, let me start with some background information on this funding scheme. In this slide, you can see the three different pillars involved under the European Framework Program for Research and Innovation, Horizon 2020. Um, this program has 80 billion to spend, and it began in 2014 and will terminate in 2020. Marie Skodowska Curie actions fall under the first, the so-called excellent science pillar. And the woman who inspired the commission to create this funding program, 
Marie Curie, was convinced that science should be international. She herself was a mobile researcher. She grew up in Poland and conducted most of her influential research in France. The Marie Skłodowska Curie actions have an allocated total budget of 6.2 million euro over the seven years of Horizon 2020. All research areas are funded with no thematic call or priorities. They follow a so-called bottom-up approach, meaning that the topics are not defined by the European Commission and applicants are free to choose a research area and topic. A strong focus is on researchers' career development and training, and the central objective of the Marie Skłodowska Curie actions is thus to enhance the career prospects of researchers all along the career path. A very central aspect is mobility, which should be intersectoral, international and interdisciplinary. There are annual calls for proposals, which will be detailed in the coming slides. There are four, May, uh, four Marie Skudowska Curie actions. The individual fellowships, the research and staff, innovation staff exchange, innovative training networks and co-fund. The individual fellowships aim at enabling talented researchers to work on their own research projects within or outside Europe to acquire new skills and thus develop their careers. The individual fellowships are for what the EC calls experienced researchers, <clears throat> meaning that they should either hold a PhD or have more than four years of full-time equivalent research experience in order to be eligible for these individual fellowships. Possible hosts are universities, research centers, companies, including SMEs, and also other non-academic sector organizations. Proposals are submitted by the researchers in liaison with a future host, and successful proposals receive up to three years support. The aim of the COFUND scheme is to support regional, national or international programs to foster excellence in human resource development in research and innovation. Both doctoral and postdoctoral fellowship programs are supported and co-funded and hosts can be either universities, research centers, companies or other non-academic sector organizations. Successful proposals from organizations that fund or manage the doctoral or fellowship program receive a fixed amount for each supported researcher as a contribution to the total costs. The aim of the innovative training networks is to promote innovative research and doctoral training in Europe and to develop research skills for innovation within and outside academia. Consortia of at least three partners can apply for these training network programs. And successful proposals from a network receive funding for up to four years to cover researcher allowances, as well as the costs of research, training and networking and management activities. And finally, there is also the Research and Innovation Staff Exchange, which aims at enhancing the international dimension of research and innovation by stimulating interaction between academia and non-academia in different countries. We will hear a lot more about this opportunity in the course of the webinar. But first, let me show you the timetable of this year's calls for the different Marie Skudowska Curie actions. There is one call per year, so the, there are annual calls um, to 2019's ITN call already closed in January, so the next ITN call that will open next October will already be the 2020 call. In April, the individual fellowship call will open with a deadline in September, the same for the 2019 co-fund call. And the current RISE call is open with a deadline on 2 April. Um, the 2020 RISE call will open on, five, uh, on 5th December this year with a deadline on 7th April next year. So now let us have a closer look at the Research and Innovation Staff Exchange. Before I give an overview on how to participate in RISE, it is important um, to understand how it works. Firstly, the RISE structure consists of participating organizations from the academic and non-academic sector based in Europe and outside Europe. 
This network of organizations develop, develops an, organ, uh, an innovative research project in an area that is significant to them. The objectives of the research project are achieved through staff secondments from one participating organization to another. The overall aim is to increase the transfer of knowledge between the network. And additionally, other activities should be scheduled amongst the network to complement the comments and increase the transfer of knowledge, such as training events and workshops. Participating institutions can be institutions from the academic sector, such as higher education establishments, non-profit research organizations, as well as international European interest organizations. Also, institutions from the non-academic sector can participate. So basically, companies, also including SMEs, multinationals, and also NGOs, etc. Within a consortium, there are different roles and responsibilities. And so there are also different terms for participating organizations in the Marie Skudowska Curie actions. The beneficiary signs the grant agreement, claims costs, and receives funding. RICE beneficiaries can only be organizations within European countries, such as member states and associated countries. They contribute directly to the RICE project and host and second staff members. Partner organizations do not sign the grant agreement or claim costs directly. In RICE, partner organizations can only be organizations based in third countries. Like the beneficiaries, they contribute directly to the RISE project. They host secondments and second staff members. In regards to the RISE consortium, there are three requirements for the participating organizations involved in a RISE consortium. There has to be a minimum of three participating organizations independent of each other. For the country requirements, there has to be a minimum of three countries, of which at least two must be in different European countries, such as member states or associated countries. For the sectoral requirements, there is a requirement for intersectoral secondments between European organizations. RISE secondments involve sending staff members to other participating organizations to achieve two short-term goals of the RISE. The first goal is that staff members perform tasks to achieve the objectives of the proposed research and innovation project. And the second goal includes staff members developing new research and transferable skills to boost future career opportunities through the RISE action and connected networking activities. Staff members are eligible to carry out secondments provided they have been working in the organization for at least one month before the secondment. Staff members who can carry out secondments are early stage researchers, so researchers with less than four years of research experience and have no PhD. Experienced researchers, these are researchers with more than four years of research experience or a PhD. And addition, you can include administrative staff, managerial staff, and technical staff supporting the research and innovation activities of the proposed project. Please note that funding for the RISE project is calculated based on the number of person months throughout the duration of the project. One staff member can be funded for a minimum of one month and a maximum of 12 months. And there is a maximum of 540 person month of EU funded secondments per RISE project. This is equal to 45 secondments that are for 12 months each. And the maximum project duration is four years. I will now show you the budget to demonstrate how it is calculated using these secondment person month. The researcher unit costs and institutional unit costs shown indicate the per month contribution. The budget is calculated automatically by calculating the secondment person month. The RISE funding is allocated to the coordinator who distributes the contribution to each beneficiary according to their secondment person month by staff members to other participating organizations. 
Please note that the salary of the seconded staff is not covered by the 2,100 euro top-up allowance per month. This top-up allowance can be used to support travel, accommodation and subsistence costs for the staff member during the secondment, but not to cover the salary. And there is no country correction coefficient applied. So it is the same amount independent of the country of origin and where the staff goes for secondment. The 1,800 euro per month for research training and networking costs can be spent on costs of research and innovation, on consumables, laboratory costs, participation to conferences, workshops and networking activities and others. The 700 euro per month for the management and indirect costs are spent for the management of the program, administrative organization and the implementation of the secondments, for the financial management, HR or also legal advice. In order to be classified as eligible secondment and receive the associated funding as a result, there are a number of criteria to be fulfilled. Eligible secondments are secondments between Europe and third country organizations within any sector, then international secondments between organizations in Europe, uh, intersectoral secondments, excuse me, between organizations in Europe, and the same staff member can be seconded to different hosting organizations as long as they spend at least one month in the organization. For example, a staff member might want to go to company for five months and to another organization for seven months. It is okay if one organization in the consortium seconds or hosts more staff members than another participating organization. So there are no conditions um, of the distribution um, of secondments between participating organizations. And finally, there is an inbuilt return mechanism. This is another important consideration in relation to secondments. This means that after the secondment period, the exchange staff members should be reintegrated back into the sending organization. So for the intra-European exchanges, only secondments can be funded that cross borders and sectors, but secondments within the same country or within the same sectors are not eligible. Here's an example of eligible European secondments. Secondments between European organizations, which are based in member states and associated countries must be intersectoral, as mentioned. You see in this example that eligible secondments are between the university in Switzerland and a company in Spain, as well as between the company in Spain and the university in France, but not between the university in Switzerland and the university in France, as this would not be intersectoral. And here's an example of ineligible European secondments. In this example, there are three participating organizations in Europe, either based in a member state or in an associated country. The secondment between the university in Norway to the university in Germany is ineligible since they are both in the academic sector. And the secondment between the university in Germany and the company in Germany is ineligible as they are both in the same country. The international projects, so the Europe third country exchanges are more interesting for most of you probably. For the comments between participating organizations in EU member state or associated countries and organizations in third countries, the sector is irrelevant. However, the comments within the same or between different third countries are not eligible. Here's an example of eligible third country secondments. Secondments between organizations in Europe and third country organizations can be between any sector. In the example here, there are two participating organizations in Europe, of which one is from a member state and one from an associate country, and additionally, a third country academic organization from Argentina. Secondments from and to the university in Argentina are eligible. And here I show you an example of, of ineligible third country secondments, secondments between two third countries, as in this ex example, Canada and Argentina, are not eligible. 
So given that the secondments planned are eligible, EU member states and associated countries are eligible to receive funding automatically. The funding for third countries on the RISE scheme is to determined by secondments taken. Third countries funding eligibility is based on whether third countries are listed in the general Annex A of the relevant uh, the general work program or whether they are not listed in this general Annex A. Third countries listed in the general Annex of the work program are generally eligible to receive funding. So in a RISE project, third countries listed in the general Annex A to the work program are eligible to receive funding for hosting incoming staff and also to receive funding for sending staff to European in institution. Countries not listed in Annex A are generally not eligible to receive funding except for two cases, if their participation is deemed essential or if funding is provided under bilateral scientific or technical agreements. Countries not eligible to receive funding are eligible for hosting incoming staff in their organization, but they are not eligible to receive funding for sending staff to European organizations. Here's an example of how a third country listed uh, in Annex A can participate in a RISE project. On this slide, you see three participating organizations. The third country organization is a university in Indonesia. Third country staff secondments to Europe are eligible for funding under Annex A of the General Work Program. They're also eligible to receive funding for staff coming to their organization in the third country. On this slide, I show you an example of an organization not listed in Annex A of the General Work Program and thus not eligible for funding. As you can see here, for the university in Australia, third country staff secondments to Europe are not eligible for funding, except for exceptional cases described earlier in this presentation. However, they are eligible to receive funding for European staff second to their organization in the third country. So to repeat briefly, if you are planning to participate in a RISE action, there are a number of considerations to take into account when planning. Firstly, the consortium composition. It must meet minimum consortium requirements. And you should also identify what participating organizations are needed. You should have a clear research and innovation goal. In MSCA, there is no defined topic. However, your research must address the societal, economic or scientific priority that is beyond state of the art. Furthermore, you should think of the impact of your consortium collaboration. Each participating organization should bring specific know-how and expertise in the research and innovation goal being addressed. They should also offer exchanges internationally and intersectorally. And finally, you should be clear in what type of secondments are needed to achieve the research and innovation goals. You must ensure the secondments are eligible or what secondments are needed to achieve the research outputs. How many secondments are needed? Who will go where, when and for what duration? So in case you are interested in setting up a consortium for a RISE project, there are two reference documents you will not get around. All the information I presented up to now and much more necessary and important information can be found in these two documents. It is on the one hand the Marie Skudowska Curie par um, part of the work program that will help you to grasp the objective and expected impact of your pro project. In there, the policy background is set out. And you can find the work program on the funding and tenders portal uh, following the, the link indicated. And the second document you need is the RISE guide for applicants, which is kind of a user's manual and which can be found following the link, the second link indicated on this slide. And this is how these documents look. To the left, the RISE guide for applicants, where you find all the information on the current call and the instructions regarding structure and content of the proposal. And to the right, the Marie Skudowska Curie Actions um, work program for the next three, for 
next two years, in which, among other things, the policy background is set out. And once you read the guide for applicants and the work program and have an idea of how such a project could work, you might want to find suitable partners for your project idea. So what can you do to find partners for a RISE project? On the funding and tenders portal, and more specific on the RISE call page, actually, you will find a partner search section. You can find there both um, expertise requests and also offers. There is a page dedicated to expressions of interest on the website of the Net for Mobility Plus project, uh, which is a new project, as I mentioned before, with the aim of facilitating transnational cooperation among NCPs for the Marie Skodowska Curie actions. And as you can see here, there is another partner search opportunity on the EURACCESS website. EURACCESS is a pan-European initiative delivering information and support services to researchers. And yet another way of finding partners for your planned project is the dedicated page on the Europe Enterprise Network website, where you can place offers as well as requests. A good idea is also to activate your network and make your colleagues aware, colleagues aware of this opportunity. For example, by taking a leaflet on RISE to your next conference. Um, this leaflet you can download under the, the link indicated on the slide. Or you could send basic RISE information and an outline of your project idea to interested colleagues. All proposals for this call must be submitted electronically using the electronic submission services of the European Commission, which are accessible from the call page on the funding and tenders portal. To get to the call page, you choose Funding Opportunities, then H2020, then the call you are interested in. And make sure you choose the right call. And then you just push the Start Submission button. And you will be guided through the submission process. You can start the submission at any time after the call opening and before the deadline. And it is important to note that every new proposal version you upload overrides the previous one. So it is advisable to start the submission process early on. And once you started the submission, you will be able also to download a rich text format version of the proposal template. Proposals should conform to this layout and to the instructions given in the guide for applicants. Projects, um, examples of funded projects can be found on CORDIS. You can easily apply filters to find projects, for example, in your country or in your research area. Once the proposals were submitted and the call deadline has passed, the evaluation of proposals takes place. It is done in panels of eight scientific areas. The evaluation of the submitted projects proposals is a peer review process, and every proposal is at least um, is read um, by at least three individual experts. Within every scientific area, a ranked list will be established, and projects are funded from top of this list until the budget is exhausted. The currently open RISE call opened on the 4th of December last year. The deadline for submissions is on 2nd April this year, so in less than two months. Mid-May, the evaluation of proposals will take place and will be finished, and a month later, the grant preparation will be launched. Most of you who are interested in setting up or participating in a RISE project are probably rather interested in the 2020 RISE call. This will open in December this year with a deadline in April 2020. And this will be the last RISE call in Horizon 2020. So the last chance to set up or participate in such a knowledge exchange project. In the first year of Horizon 2020, 203, so in 2014, 203 proposals were submitted. 
The success rate was almost at 50% as there was a fixed budget earmarked for RISE. In the year 2015, 363 proposals were submitted and in 2016, 367, which was the highest number. Since then, the number of sub submitted proposals decreased again. In last year's call, there were um, 275 proposals submitted. And in the last year's uh, RISE call, um, there were 272 eligible proposals submitted and 73 made it to the main list, meaning that they were funded. This resulted in a success rate of more than 25%. A closer look at the eight scientific panels shows that the number of proposals submitted in the different panels varies a lot. There are, for, for example, many proposals submitted in the engineering panel and only a few in the mathematics panel. Now we will have a look at what, what such a RISE proposal submission entails, what a proposal is all about. There are basically two parts to each RISE proposal, part A and part B. In part A, the applicants will be asked for administrative details and information on the secondments. This information will be used in the evaluation and further processing of the proposal. Part A is an integral part of the proposal. In section one of part A, you need to provide general information about the proposal. Here you choose, for example, the panel and the descriptors. Also, the abstract is part of section one. In section two, you are asked to provide data on the participating organization. For each participating organization, the coordinator should complete the table provided by the online submission system. So here the coordinator indicates it's the period, duration and the destination of the outgoing secondments planned by each participating organization. Once the secondments plan of all participating organizations is encoded, a summary table indicating the number of secondments allocated to each participating organization, the global number of secondments and the total budget requested for the action will be shown. So the budget as mentioned, is calculated automatically according to the information you feed it in section two. In section four, you need to fill the ethics table, and in section five, you will need to answer some call specific questions. Instructions on how to complete the five sections in part A can be found in the guide for applicants from page uh, 33 onward. Part B contains the details of the proposed RISE project, along with the practical arrangements planned to implement them. They will be used by the independent experts to undertake their assessment. Applicants must structure their proposal according to the headings indicated in the template, which, as I mentioned, can be downloaded in rich text format from the electronic submission system. Proposals must conform to this layout and to the instructions given in the guide for applicants. And part B must be submitted as two separate documents, B1 and B2. Document B1 comprises one page for the start page, where the proposal acronym is indicated, one page only for the table of content. The actual core part of the proposal, sections two to four, describing the project, can be 30 pages long. So the maximum total length for document one is 32 pages. The overall page limit will be strictly applied and applicants should therefore keep the proposal within the page limit as experts will be strictly instructed to disregard any excess pages above the 32 page limit. Document B2 must consist of part B, sections five to eight. No overall page limit will be applied to this document, but it is important to respect the instructions given per section. For example, in section six, a maximum of one page per, per beneficiary and half a page per third country partner organization can be spent. So for the ones who would like to know a bit more about um, the core part of the proposal, we will have a look at the different parts now. So the proposal uh, 
uh, B1, parts two, three, and four. Not in detail, but just to give you an idea of what information you should provide. In the first subchapter of the excellence part, research in, in innovation goals should be described. Also the state of the art and how the project will go beyond it should be described, as well as the methodologies and the inter- or multidisciplinary aspects of the planned project. Gender aspects should also be addressed. Of course, only where applicable. And the question here would be, at what point down the line will your outcome affect women and men differently? Table B1 needs to be filled, and here the title of the scientific work packages should give a good idea of the scope of the research or innovation objectives of that work package. Here the transfer of knowledge goal should be described. It should be described what kind of knowledge will be transferred and how this will be accomplished. It should also be described how the secondments will contribute to the transfer of knowledge, what kind of events are planned and when. It is important to consider both the secondments as well as the return phases. And it is important to show how the knowledge sharing will contribute to achieving the aims of the research activities described in 2.1. In the third subchapter of the excellence part, you should state what each partner will contribute towards achieving the research and knowledge transfer objectives including their expertise, their contribution to networking events, and their level of participation in the secondments. Furthermore, you are asked to justify how the networking events described in 2.2 in will contribute to the knowledge sharing objectives. You explain here why you have chosen these particular uh, activities and outline the benefits of the knowledge sharing to the participating organizations. It's a good idea to summarize the planned secondments in a secondments table to show who will be where and when. This plan can be included in the excellence section. It is important that it corresponds to the entries in part A. Each secondment has to be well justified and the secondments should be well balanced as well. In the impact part of the RISE proposal, the expected impact should be pointed out on different levels, like staff members, institutions, and also European society. Here you de develop a vision of future collaborations on a personal and institutional level. Detailed plans for dissemination and communication or outreach and exploitation should be described here. There are also three subchapters in this impact part. In the first subchapter of this part, it should be described who will gain new knowledge and how. Benefits should be pointed out, as for example, mutual understanding of working environment in academia and non-academia, or working outside Europe or in a different research environment. Researchers benefit of being exposed to other environments, which will help them to enlarge networks or to publish in high impact journals to bring the outcome to the market, etc. The overall aim is to show an understanding of how participating in the RISE project will help the staff to enhance their potential and improve their career prospects. If you can, make a link to EU policies about research careers and employability. For example, a general new skills and jobs, I indicated a link here. In this subchapter, um, the second of the impact uh, part, um, a vision of future collaborations should be created. Plans for collaborations after the end of the project should be pointed out. Under the indi link indicated on this slide, um, EU policies to international and intersectoral collaboration, for example, the key initiative of the Uni Innovation Union can be found.
The third subchapter of the impact part is about exploitation and dissemination of the results. The description of such should be as specific and detailed as possible. A clear dissemination plan should be provided. What are key target groups? How, when and via which channel will they be reached? It should be described who will eventually benefit from the results. An example of a plan for the exploitation and dissemination of results can be found here. IP rights should be checked with the different institutions involved. If help is needed, uh, the EU IP help desk has a lot of useful information in easy accessible form and language. The last subchapter of the impact part is about the communication of the project activities to different target audiences. I just realized I said the impact part has three subchapters, but in fact it has four. So <laughs> this is 3.4 and it's the last uh, subchapter of the impact part. So here you should make a plan and try to phrase your key messages according to your audience. It is advisable to work with the network um, of the different beneficiaries and with their media offices. Check if and how the research results eventually could be of interest and of impact towards society at large in Europe. Who will eventually benefit and how do you reach these people? You can use a table for the communication activities or you can describe them in a specific chapter or combine both. Go into as much detail as possible and make sure you don't confuse communication and dissemination activities. So in this last of the three uh, core parts of the RISE proposal, the implementation part, you outline the plan for how you will carry out the project you described in the excellence section. The more details you provide, the more concrete and credible the project will appear. And as, as the excellence and the impact part, also the implementation part of the RISE is, uh, proposal is structured into different subchapters. Here also four different subchapters actually. <clears throat> In the first subchapter uh, of the implementation part, a work plan needs to be presented. The aim of such is to show that what you propose is indeed feasible and credible. There is a table um, B2 available in the template which needs to be filled with details. As a rule of thumb, the project should have three to four scientific work packages, one each for management, dissemination, communication and exploitation, and one for transfer of knowledge. But this is just a rule of thumb. And there are even more tables to be filled as, for example, the deliverables list and also the milestones list in this first subchapter of the implementation part. Here you describe which management structure you have, which subboards um, do you have, who reports to whom, and how are decisions taken should be outlined. And you outline also the role of the coordinator and which kind of support you will have, for example, for administrative tasks. There is also a risk table that you should fill in diligently and prepare it together with your consortium. And this part should not be a duplication of the table in section six, where you describe the participating organizations. But here you should describe how the participants have the right set of skills, expertise, meaning like human infrastructure, and the right technical infrastructure, including infrastructure and support services in terms of administration, human resources, or communication. If applicable, include and list in table B, 3D, the beneficiaries or partner organizations that will participate together with other entities under capital link and shortly describe the legal arrangement and the roles of each affiliated entity in the proposal. In this last section, you should describe why your consortium partners are the only and best to carry out all of the project's tasks. 
describe complementarities and synergies as well as previous experiences of the partners and why these enable them to carry out their tasks. The individual members of the consortium are described in section 6. There is no need to repeat that information in this section. Yeah. So now you have a rough overview of the content of a, such a RISE proposal. And you might as well have a lot of questions in the meantime. In the next part of our webinar, I will show you where you can get support if you need. So if you need support, the European Commission, as well as the Net for Mobility Plus project, run a frequently asked question page where you find answers to all sorts of questions. Also about third country participation in such RISE projects. There are several uh, questions and answers related to that in these um, frequently asked questions blogs. Then um, a very useful link is the one to the different help desks, which are accessible via the funding and tenders portal. From the research uh, inquiry service, you usually get answers to your questions within a very short time. And very importantly, um, on this page, you find also the link to the national contact points uh, contact details. As mentioned before, please contact the person working in the country where your institution is located. You find the NCP's contact data very easily accessible also on the Net for Mobility Plus web page. And finally, EURACCESS um, is a pan-European initiative. Um, this is uh, actually, uh, I show you here, EURACCESS Worldwide. It is an initiative delivering information and support services to researchers. EURACCESS Worldwide is a networking tool specifically supporting researchers working outside of Europe who wish to connect or stay connected with Europe. Whether you want to know more about European research policy as well as mobility, funding or further collaboration opportunities, EURACCESS Worldwide has dedicated teams in many countries outside Europe, which can be contacted if you're interested. And with this, I would like to thank you for listening and wish you a very nice day.